You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com we are uh i'm really excited to have stefan from mexico if you're a founder uh in the fintech business you need to know about exignite so stefan welcome thank you howard do we have uh Ex so quickly and Stefan's like a, a, a customer, we're a customers of Exignite. How long, when, how long ago did you start the company? More than 10 years ago. 10 year old overnight success. Um, if you get to chat with Stefan after the event and from current.com to stock twits, uh, it's been a journey. And he's a warrior as all founders can be after four or five years. The, uh, what does Exignite do specifically? Sure. So what we do is uh, we provide financial market data from the cloud via APIs. So uh, you know, market data is the lifeblood of finance. You can see all the presentations we saw before, full of charts, right, full of data. Essentially, we provide that data uh, to those charts. Right? Um, and we, we enable, we sit kind of behind the curtain, if you want. Um, now, what we do is we do it from the cloud. And so we have the, the largest, biggest, badass suite of market data APIs, yeah. if you want. Um, yeah, very large data set. Um, we launched our first API, as we said, back more than 10 years ago, 2006. Uh, we've been on the cloud since 2008. We were the first company to actually do that as well. Uh, we have more than 1,000 customers using our APIs today, including Stock uh, StockTwits and Spark Finance, and, Spark and many of our customers are here as well. Uh, we've got Yearly, we've got US News, Trigger, I think is here, uh, is Scout Robin Finance, Robinhood. Robin Hood. Um, so many startups have used IAPI, but also large financial institutions do that as well. And so the four commas, because I, I have two commas in my financial statements. You have four commas. Yeah. Uh, is that a trillion? <laughs> So how many of you watch Silicon Valley? Yeah? Trace Commerce, right? Trace Commerce Club. A billionaire, if you're a billionaire, you've got Trace Commerce. And we've got four. And the reason is because uh, just at the end of last month, we reached more than one trillion API requests served on our platform. That's called API vanity, if you want. And what is, quickly, <laughs> an API for sure. old people? API is a simple way to call uh, data, you know, call, get something from, programmatically over the web. So APIs just make access to data very easy. Uh, developers can just integrate data in a few minutes. Uh, and it goes away with a lot of the legacy technology that has been uh, uh, typically the, the fair in the world of market data. So, so we've got a club, and uh, actually I've got a t-shirt for you, oh. you know? Because eh? yeah. you helped us do this, right? So API, Forecom a Club. More than one trillion API requests, all right? So thank you, Howard, for helping us. Thank you to all, all our, our customers doing My this. My son is trying to make this a one mm -hmm. comma. Uh, sure, sure. The, so just to give you an idea, in, in September, that was about 250 billion API requests. That's more than 100 calls per second, right? Uh, uh, that's more than tweets than uh, Twitter serves. It's more, uh, so, uh, more calls than uh, Google serves in terms of search. Can you so say who your biggest customer is or not customer, who's hitting you the most? Uh, no, probably couldn't say that, but it's mostly driven by the fact that initially people just pulled data and brought it to their data centers, brought it to their systems, and now uh, because the cloud has made this possible, so Amazon who is here, Scott, thank you, all made that possible. Things can scale so much so that we can actually deliver data directly to individuals from our platform. So many of our clients now have mobile applications with you know, millions of users, and instead of you know, building technology to deliver data to those users, we do that for them. 
And that's what's driving the volumes, if yep. you want. Right. And so when you, uh, I'll end with a couple other questions. So a lot yeah. of startups use Xignite like stock twins. Can you tell that we're growing without us knowing? Could you, could you have a sit down with me and say, Howard, you're doing better than you think? Or is there any way that Xignite has insight into how StockTwits is doing? And you mean in terms of using the data and whatnot? Yeah, yeah we would, we'd be able to tell you know, what you're using, because we track everything. Every one little code that we make, we track it, and we see whether you're consuming more and more data, what type of data you're consuming, who is looking at what on StockTwits, potentially. So if you're not tracking it, we could definitely track it. Yeah. So, who, so, so as a startup, we use X and Night. Why, why are people doing it? Well, <clears throat> and why we, should startups, like, how do you think about X and yeah. Actually, we were a fintech startup ourselves. We didn't start doing what we're doing. We started uh, building a, a wealth management software. Right. And uh, we needed That's what marketing. X and Night was first? That's what we did. I, I was okay. telling the, the story to Jason Resnick earlier. We started as a wealth management software company, so we needed data. And we, we were pretty naive, and we thought we should have an API for it, and we couldn't find it. So we actually started creating APIs by scraping Yahoo Finance and just building some, uh, which was not a real product, right? It was a demo. And uh, we got more interest in that in our wealth management platform. So we did a very early pivot. Uh, it, this was more than 10 years ago, and we started building this platform, which is now the biggest you know, market data distribution platform from the cloud. Uh, so it, and we are powering a lot of the wealth management platform, the robo-advisor. And the main reason is this, it's innovation, right? Uh, historically, if you wanted to get data, you had to go to some big legacy vendors, use a lot of old technologies, a lot of hardware, a lot of software. With us, you just wrote a couple lines of code and you spent all your hard raised capital innovating, building new things. So stuck to it, same thing. You don't spend too much time dealing with market data. You spend time trying to create a great destination, great value for your users. So, you know, Wealthfront used us as early as 2008. Betterment used us at the beginning, Robinhood. So all those guys, they were startups. They were not, they didn't have any problem with clouds. They loved APIs, so they used us, and they were able to innovate. Uh, for, Wall Street had left a big open road to innovation post, you know, mortgage crisis, and so Silicon Valley just engulfed itself into this. So that's why you're innovating. ramping up. Yes. But why? So how is it different than me having to need NASDAQ or Reuters? Well, uh, so these are different, right? What we, what we try to do is uh, we try to integrate uh, the world's data on it. Our vision is to have one place in the cloud where you have all the world's data so that you can easily consume it. This means integrating data coming from many different sources. NASDAQ is one, other exchanges, other vendors. So you want a one-stop shop, right? So. Uh, NASDAQ, who is one of our biggest partners, you know, provides some of the data, but they don't have everything, right? Now, Reuters has a lot of data, but the way you, to get it is very complicated. Right? It's a very expensive, so it doesn't foster innovation. So what we differ, the way we differ is one-stop shop, all these data, all these data points, all this data are available to developers to innovate. And that ultimately benefits the, the active investor, right? Because they get better apps, they get better insight, uh, and they get those solutions at a lower cost. Wow. And you raised capital. When was the last time you raised capital? In January, we raised uh, oh. yeah, $20 million. Yeah. So they raised $20 million. I mean, you, these are companies you've never heard about, and this is why I'm so bullish on fintech. You know, we can throw up a lot of charts. The, well, congratulations on yeah, that. Who's the, who the investor? It was actually the largest Japanese market data company who is now using our platform for for their own business. How many so. are you hiring? There's a lot of MBAs here today. Are you hiring? Uh, we, we, we hire more developers and salespeople than MBAs, but it's. <laughs> and, where, and where are you located? Where's your We're headquarters? We're in, in the Bay Area. The, um, and where were you born? Uh, I'm French, but don't hold it against me, please. <laughs> and, and, and does Donald Trump know you're here? <laughs> the, uh, um, I'll probably get kicked out. <laughs> okay, so we, we talk I'll about come fintech. Back legally. We, we talk about fintech. Are banks. You know, we hate the banks. Yeah. Are, are they catching on? Or is it too late? Or Yeah, so for the longest time, the banks were head in the sand, worrying about regulation and whatnot. And obviously, Silicon Valley, FinTech, you, everybody else just started scaring the, the crap out of them. And uh, they woke up, right? And they realized we've got, you know, robot advice is real. You know, this this issue about customer service, uh, better value for the customer. So now they're really turning around and embracing things and trying to look at two things. How can they innovate 
And so they'll look at different technologies that make that possible. And they will look at uh, reducing their cost as well. Because you know, a large bank, uh, the top tier banks, spend probably three, four hundred million dollars on market data a year, and about as much just on the technology to be able to, to use it. And all of that ends up being paid by the investors. Right? Uh, and that is very expensive. Every bank builds the same you know, data centers with the same data coming from the same exchanges and same thing. And all of that is replicated. And it's highly inefficient. At an industry level, it's a complete waste. Um, data should be stored once and used by everyone. So and, I, and so that's our vision. So I have this question. So yeah. I'm long NASDAQ cause, just because of data, mm -hmm. right? Until, and they have, in my opinion, some form of monopoly. So that's my proxy. You know, I can't own Exignite. So I own NASDAQ. I, I can own Amazon, and Scott's here, so I own Amazon because of the data play. What can, is there, is there, what is, where does all this data mean? What's gonna, what does it mean for the active investor? Like, what is it? Well, I, I think what it means is, um, is again, that if, you, if we're able to achieve the dream of putting all this data in a central place, which probably is going to be Amazon, because it's already mostly there. Um, make it easily accessible. It's not one big database with everything that, that never works, right? But all this data available via APIs can be consumed directly by investors or by application providers and, and developers. Uh, you get a few things. First, you get uh, much ro more reduced costs, right? Like Robinhood, which was able to provide zero cost trading. One of the reasons is because they were able to optimize their, their market data cost, which is a big cost for yeah. many firms. So they were able to really like, you know, be very optimi optimize that very much. But the other thing is now you have all this data in one place, and so you can get more value from it. So I think from the, for the active investor, it will mean a lot of innovation, a lot more analytics that will happen in the cloud, a lot more discovery uh, of trends, uh, discovery of value, if you want. And we have many of our clients here who are doing this. They're you know, through coming up with new products, new things to actually help you and other investors actually extract more. Uh, but the flip side, I, I think, is it also means all this data is available to machines. Yes. And not necessarily you know, algo traders, but artificial intelligence, you know, robot advisors, and things like this. And it means that a lot of the value will be extracted by those. And maybe it's going to get more and more difficult for the active investor to find an edge, yeah. right? Uh, so there's more, more wealth of information, more analytics, more value, but uh, as an individual, it'd be harder and harder to take advantage of that. Yeah. But the computers, I think, will build on top of that. And yeah. so maybe the, 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 the room left for the, the analysis is gonna be less and less. Are you bullish on FinTech? I mean, so you have a, uh, Amazon has the grand poobah seat, you have a, a poobah seat, or a grand seat, how does fintech look? You see so many startups, and, and we have other problems. We have the app store problems, we have discovery problems, we have UI problems, we've got platforms to build on. But overall, looking down as a, a data lord uh, and a data provider and a data um, uh, accelerator, mm -hmm. how, what's your opinion on fintech? We're well, still bullish on fintech. We don't see the investments lowering. Uh, and we are a global company. We see huge growth in Asia, huge growth in, in uh, mainland China, where you have a lot of investors. We power many applications there. There's so much money trying to invest globally, which is still locked down. And, uh, so there's just massive opportunities uh, in other markets, EMEA in Asia. Fintech is still accelerating dramatically there. Um, and and as, as we said earlier, fintech is also transitioning into the banks, right? And so fintech now becomes as much, you know, trying to disrupt the banks, coming up with new things as it is trying to empower them. And ultimately, you know, they won't disappear. They will just become better and more efficient, right? And, and that's it. So to people who are negative, I look at Exignite and I go, no one's ever heard of it. And I go, wow, this is what makes me super bullish, is this is an enabler, a speedometer for the rest of the world. So while we lose jobs elsewhere, these kind of company, your company creates hundreds of jobs in a different, diverse area. Anyways, amazing company. Uh, you're going to hang around. Uh, oh, yeah. So if you're a startup here, uh, or have questions, Stefan uh, will be here uh, for answers. And you're traveling the world yes. doing this stuff. So and if you want a t-shirt, four commas, we don't have them here, but come up by our booth and we'll happily ship you one. They're kind of cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.